Hey, Pastor Rob here. Just wanted to thank you for checking out our messages online and wanted to encourage you. I pray that your soul is nourished through the hearing of the word. But at the same time, the writer of Hebrews is very clear about uh, not giving up meeting together. Don't give up the larger gathering. As a matter of fact, in the book of Acts, the early church made it a point to meet together almost daily even, breaking bread together, encouraging one another, being in communion with one another to build each other up. And, and that is vitally important to your spiritual walk. So I pray that you enjoy this message. But at the same time, I pray that you find a great church body to be a part of, whether that be here at the bridge or somewhere else, so that you can be built up as well. Thank you and God bless. We've been preaching for 10 weeks um, uh, uh, a bunch of sermons about a sermon, okay? So if you want any hints on how deep this church gets, that's about as deep as it gets, okay? Uh, we like to preach sermons on sermons, but uh, uh, the whole gist behind this series has been that we might be able to get back to the way of Jesus, Okay, and, and, and now let me ask you this, whether you're a believer or not this morning, whether you're a Christian or not, whether you would say you're someone who follows Jesus or not, how many of you would say that, man, the church has kind of lost its way? Come on, raise your hand. Come on, let's just be honest. Let's be candid. We're a, trans we're a vulnerable church this morning, right? The church has kind of lost its way, hasn't it? And, and, and that's what this whole series is based on. And, and we've been in it for about 10 weeks. And if I'm honest with you, I could preach throughout this series for about 20 to 30 weeks because this sermon that we're digging into is Jesus's probably his most famous sermon um, that we know of. And as Jesus preaches this, and as I'm reading his message, all I can do is just sit there and go, man, there's so much here. I could chew on this thing for weeks. I could dig into it for weeks. There's so much that I could pull from it. So many things that we could pick apart and talk about. Um, so today, if you haven't been with us for the next 10, for the last 10 weeks, what I'd like to do is spend the next three hours catching you up. Does that sound good? All right, sweet. We're going to have a Pastor Rob Marathon. It's going to be so good, Okay. No, uh, uh, maybe, maybe we'll just give you a short, a short uh, um, uh, catch up here. Um, we're going to rewind it back a bit, okay? When I first started this series, um, when God laid it on my heart, um, I remember sitting in my office and going, Lord, draw us back to the way of Jesus. I mean, God, just draw us back. I mean, the, the church has, has lost his sight of exactly what you've called us to, whether it's one way or another. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. But um, as we wrap up to today's series, though, I, I want to dig at you with a question, okay? And, and some of you are here for the first time. Some of you maybe have no relationship with Jesus, and we're so glad you're here. And we hope that you are encouraged to wrestle with God today and, and this whole thing that we call faith, okay? Um, uh, but, but, but the question I want to dig at with you with is the same question that I actually started this series with, okay? And that question is this. Are you ready? Are you sure that you want to be a follower of the way? We're going to run this back and we're going to end the series the same way we started. Are you sure you want to be a follower of the way? Now, some of you are thinking the way, are we, are we talking about Mandalorian or Christianity here? Like, what are you talking about, Rob? Okay. Um, when I talk about the way, I'm talking about, this is, this is what Christians were known as before they were called Christians. Before they were called Christians by a famous emperor, okay, um, we were actually called followers of the way. And, and, and if you decide, if you, 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 you are absolutely sure you want to be a follower of the way, it's important that you understand the implications of that decision, okay? Because, because if, if you do want to be a follower of the way, I fear that too many of us don't actually realize the implications that go along with that answer, if you're somebody who's wrestling with your faith and you're going, Rob, I'll be honest with you, this is the first time I've been in church in months or years or whatever it is, or I, Rob, I don't attend church. Man, what, what we're going to be calling uh, all of you today is a big deal, and we want you to take it seriously. And if you're not willing to step into this, um, man, don't fake it. We're a church that values authenticity, and, and, and that's why we encourage people when we take communion, hey, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, don't take of communion. Because the Bible says that you eat and drink condemnation on yourself. And not only that, we are a church that, that, that wants to be a safe place for anybody. No matter what kind of walk life uh, of life you've been in. We said this last week, we are a no matter church. Amen? Amen. No matter church. We're a no matter church, which means that no matter who you are, no matter where you've been, no matter who, what, what you've done, no matter what's been done to you, this is a safe place for you to find God and be loved here. We don't care. We're, 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 we're a come as you are church, right? Um, I preach in jeans and a, and a button up on Sunday. That's what I tell people all, all the time. Um, but if you want to be a follower of the way, 
If you do decide to make that decision, you need to understand the implications. You see, to be a follower of the way, you have to step into the beliefs, you have to step into the radiance, and you have to step into the rhythms of Jesus. You have to step into those things. It means that the rhythms of your life should be different due to Jesus. It means that when we look at Scripture, when we open our Bibles, if we open our Bibles, which we should, amen? When we open our Bibles, we don't sit here and cut out the parts that make us uncomfortable or the parts that we don't like or the parts that culture is kind of pushing back against right now. It means that we look at people differently. It means that we treat people differently. It means that we love people differently than the rest of the world. It means that we are not conformed to the patterns of this world, but we are what? Transformed by the renewing of our minds. We're transformed. Morally, morally right now in America, we're being pulled in one of two directions, aren't we? I mean, come on, we, it's no secret. Our nation is divided, right? We're being pulled in one, two, one of two directions, and this isn't different from the rest of history, believe it or not. It's really not. Um, that's what I love about Scripture. See, Scripture doesn't just tell us about what happened, and it just doesn't, doesn't just tell us about what's going to happen. Scripture tells us about what's, what's always happening, right? It tells us about what's always happening. And throughout history, humanity has always seemed to pull in one direction or the other. The first direction is the direction of religious legalism, Right? And the second direction is the direction of liberal tolerance, both of which Jesus condemned. See, religious legalism is the idea that rules and policy matter more than people. It's usually full of judgment and condemnation. And while everyone walks on eggshells the whole time, they try to follow every single rule that's put out before them. This is what the Pharisees and Sadducees would have been known for, of which Jesus despised the most, right? Right? Because Jesus couldn't stand religious people more than anyone. This is, this is, this is the side of um, morality that the church kind of ends up falling onto a lot of times as we pursue holiness. We kind of get into this mindset of, well, you got to dress a certain way to worship Jesus, and you got to come to church, and you got to sing specific songs. If you don't sing my hymns, I don't want to be there. Or if you don't sing my type of contemporary worship music, then I'm just not really feeling the worship. Well, it's okay. We're not singing to you. Um, but the idea is, is that religious legalism is this idea that if you don't follow all these rules, then if you don't uh, stay away from the sins that I'm really good at staying away from, then you're a sinner yourself and you should be condemned. The other side of, uh, of morality that we kind of fall on is liberal tolerance. And this, that's this idea that anything goes like my truth is my truth and your truth is your truth. And as long as your truth doesn't run into my truth, then we should be good, Right. That's kind of the other direction that we land. And, and this is what the, the Greeks and the Romans and the Gentiles typically ascribe to in the New Testament time and the time of the early churches. And, and honestly, this is kind of the direction the world's going, at least in America today, right? Religious legalism and, toler and, and, and liberal tolerance, neither philosophy of which Jesus calls us to, and both of which are against one another and warring against one another constantly in this world. And the problem when you don't fall into one of those two extremes is that you end up getting pressure from both, don't you? Right? You end up getting pressure from both. I love to say this all the time. I said, my, my, my conservative friends think I'm liberal and my liberal th friends think I'm conservative. I love where I land. Like, I love it because I'm not sitting here trying to fit into any group in this world. I'm trying to fit into Jesus's group, y'all. You hear me this morning? Like, that's where I'm trying to land. Um, but if you don't land in one of those two areas, you get pressure from both sides. If you're not for us, then you're against us. You're either part of the legalists or the tolerant, the, the, the mega conservatives or the ultra liberals, the right or the left, the Republicans or the Democrats. But Jesus, Jesus leads us to a different way, doesn't he? And if you ever get a chance to read Matthew chapters 5 through 7, which is where the Sermon on the Mount is found, you get a picture of what that way looks like. And it doesn't fall into either of those extremes. So let me ask you one final time as we wrap up this series this morning, or maybe if you're here for the first time, let me ask you um, for the very first time, do you want to be a follower of the way? Are you sure? Because as I read the end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and that's what we're about to do. We're going to read the end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. As I read it this week and I sat there in my office, I realized that we as a church have made a colossal mistake over the last few decades. 
We as a church, as the big C church whole across America, have made a colossal mistake over the last few decades. And that is this, that we've told people it's easy to follow Jesus. It's a mistake. Some of you guys are probably going, wait, 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 what are you talking about, Rob, right? Well, let's talk about it, right? We've been saying that, man, it's just so easy to follow Jesus. All you got to do is just pray this prayer, repent of your sins, and then, man, it, 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 ask Jesus into your heart, and as soon as you do that, man, you're good. Don't worry about it. After that, it ain't no thing but a chicken wing, right? That's all it takes. And I fear this is a mistake, as a matter of fact, I think it's a huge mistake, not only because of the fact that we don't find a prayer like that anywhere in Scripture. There's no such thing as asking Jesus into your heart in Scripture. Did you know that? There's no such prayer found in Scripture, but there are other reasons as well about which we're going to dive into. But, but much of this idea of, of, of following Jesus being easy stems from the seeker-driven movement. Has anybody heard of the seeker-driven movement? Okay. This was a big thing in the church, in, in the, the North American church in the 70s, 80s, and 90s specifically. Um, and it was championed by guys like Bill Hybels and Andy Stanley and Robert Schuler and Rick Warren. If you guys ever heard of Purpose Driven Life, right? The guy that wrote that book kind of championed this model over the last couple decades. And, and, and let me be clear here, okay? Um, um, I'm not trying to bash those guys, okay? Millions of people came to know a relationship with Jesus because of the seeker driven movement, okay? Millions. And I don't want to discredit that. I praise God for what he's done through many of those spiritual giants here in the USA that came before me and paved the way for the church to become what it is today. But, but here's the thing. Every model has its inadequacies. Every model of reaching people has its inadequacies outside of God's model. And I'm sure, even with us, as we try to attain to God's model, um, in 20 or 30 years, the Bridge Church is probably going to, we're going to find some things that, man, we should have done this, or we probably should correct that, or we need to work on this, right? But every model has its inadequacies. And the inadequacy in the seeker-driven model of reaching people is that it focuses on comfort. It focuses on comfort. Pastors that would, succumb, that, that, that would get, step into this model of church would say, all right, what can we do to make people as comfortable as possible so that we can share the gospel with them, right? That was kind of the, the idea of the seeker-driven movement is pastors were just going, okay, we should just create a great worship team and phenomenal environment for families and we should do all this and we should make sure that we're not making people uncomfortable or not asking them to do anything uncomfortable and we should just do everything we can, we, we can to just make them feel safe and warm and fuzzy inside about themselves and if we can just do that, then we'll be able to get them in the doors. And it worked. Like it worked. Like I said, millions of people came to know Christ because of the seeker-driven mo uh, model. Um, but, but then we, we, we had a problem. Because then these people that we brought into our doors became consumers rather than Christians. And, and, and here's where the real problem lies, okay? The real problem lies in the fact that the gospel, when you really read the Bible and when you really dig into scripture, you realize that the gospel doesn't call us to be comfortable. Not at all. As a matter of fact, a lot of real growth and discipleship happens when we're made uncomfortable. I love, I actually watched a video of a Jewish rabbi that shared an illustration about a, a lobster. Have you, any of you heard this before? talks about how lobsters, when they shed their shell, okay, what forces them to shed their shell is what? They grow too big for the shell and they're made uncomfortable. And so they have to shell, shed that outer shell so they can grow a new one. Or better yet, find a new one. It, it, it has to do with this idea in our lives. It's much the same. God grows us the most when we're most uncomfortable, doesn't he? I mean, I would bet, <clears throat> as I look around this room, <clears throat> if you all look back to your most difficult moments in life, those are probably some of the biggest lessons you've ever learned. Some of the biggest lessons you've ever 
learn. So, so, so this is what I want to do today. This is what I want to do. I want us to dig into the rest of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And I want to talk about the, that, this problem that we've, we have where we're telling Christians that it's easy, or telling non-Christians or anybody that it's easy to follow Jesus. And, 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 and I want to dig into what we can do to understand the gospel for what it really is, while also helping others do the same. Okay, so this is where, where we're at. Okay, we're going we're gonna to be in Matthew chapter 7 this morning. If you don't have a Bible with you or you don't have an app for that, we don't encourage you to download, uh, to reach in front of you and grab a black Bible if you're here with us in, in person. Or um, if you're joining us online, we want to let you know that we love you, we miss you, we hope we get to uh, see you someday, okay? Um, church is about community, not just getting fed on Sunday morning, so we do hope we get to see you in person and in community. But uh, if you are joining us online, we want to encourage you to download an awesome app called Version. that's Y-O-U version. It's a great way to read scripture and share it with others. Um, and then you can read scripture with us together. So this morning we'll be in Matthew chapter seven. If you don't know how to get there, let me help you. Okay. Uh, the God, it's Matthew is one of the gospels. It's in the new Testament. So it's about two thirds to three quarters near the back of your Bible. You land in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John in that order. And we're going to dive in right away. Okay. And, and right off the bat, Jesus kind of gets at what we're talking about. Okay, and so what we're going to do is we're going to read this first paragraph, we're going to chew on it for a little bit, and then we're going to read the rest of, the, uh, of Jesus' sermon, all right? You ready? Okay, Matthew chapter 7, we're going to pick it up in verse 13, verse 13, the words of Jesus. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life. Only a few find it. All right, can we, can we just, we did this first service. Can we just read that again? I just, I want it to sink in on us, okay? okay? I want it to really hit us between the eyes. Here it is, here it is. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to what? Destruction. Destruction. And many will enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life and only few will find it. Why, why do I think it's, e it's wrong to say that following Jesus is easy? Well, because Jesus says it's not easy. Right? He says it right here. And if you've ever tried, if you've ever tried to live for Jesus, you know it's not easy, is it, church? You know what I'm talking about. Small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life. It's the harder road. It is the road less traveled. The path to Jesus is the one that very few want to take. And honestly, few will even find Few will find it, Jesus says. Can I be candid with you this morning? I hate the end of verse 14. Like, I, I, even as a Christian who, who believes he's doing everything he can to follow Jesus with everything he's got, I, I hate verse, the end of verse 14. Not because of how much I, I don't like the narrow path myself, but, but, but because of how much I fear how many people won't find it. And, and I'm not trying to be arrogant or self-righteous here, okay? Like, like there are times like, uh, where I'm not even sure if I'm on the path, right? Like, like I've, I, I'll be reading scripture at home and, and every time I open my Bible, it's like God just, have you ever had those moments where you're just spending time with the Lord and you're, and you've got your Bible cracked open and you just feel like this weight of heaviness conviction, like heavy conviction come over you. Like I, I, that happens to me all the time still. And I've been a Christian for more than 15 years. So, so, so hear my heart this morning. I'm not trying to sound self-righteous. Like, like, I think I've found the, the narrow road. I, but as I read scripture, I, I feel this huge conviction. And, and not only that, my heart just breaks for those that I know. I mean, I know aren't doing anything to follow Jesus. Even some that genuinely think they are, but they clearly aren't. And we're going to talk about how we know if someone's clearly not following Jesus, okay? But here's the thing. And I think this is important for us, as if, you're, if you would call yourself a follower of the way this morning. I hate it because it breaks me. Not because it angers me. 
Do you hear what I'm saying? Religious people get angry over sin. Followers of Jesus get broken over sin. Let me just say that again. Religious legalism gets angry over sin. Followers of Jesus get broken over it. Following Jesus isn't easy. The gate is small and the path is narrow. And a lot of times that path is far from comfortable. I mean, have you been with us the last 10 weeks? The way of Jesus is hard. Just, just listen to some of our bottom lines over the last 10 weeks. We said this uh, uh, earlier, that if you want to be a follower of the way, you need to step into the beliefs, rhythms, and radiance of Jesus. All things that are antithetical to the direction of our communities and culture uh, uh, and, and the way that they're headed. Let, let, me, though, let me, though, just, just start off um, uh, by listing off all, 10 we, uh, all of the, the, the different bottom lines we've had through these last few weeks. And let's just look at what Jesus calls us to in, in his way, and you can decide whether this is easy or not. How about that? Let's just do this. So, so here's, here's the, your, your, your 60 second recap of the last 10 weeks, okay? The, the way of Jesus calls us to get past the surface, and it calls us to get at the heart and be salt and light. How good are you at looking at someone's heart rather than their actions? The way of Jesus calls us to God's love and intentions, to his love and his tensions. He's not calling us to follow a bunch of rules and regulations. He wants his will to be our will. To live for his love and, and, and intentions rather than search for minimum and, minimums and loopholes. Man, there are so many people that are great at finding G, loopholes in Scripture. The way of Jesus calls us to love our enemies in a culture right now that seems like they're doing everything possible to make as, enemy, as many enemies as possible. Have you ever heard of something called cancel culture? right? Everybody's looking to attack somebody. If you don't believe me, step on social media for about a half a second. You'll find it, right? The way of Jesus calls us to not live for our glory but, or good, but for God's glory and for his kingdom. I love what, my, what one of my favorite authors, his name is J.D. Greer, he said, we can't build God's kingdom until we tear down our own. Man, that's a big statement. Some of us right now are spending a lot of time building our own kingdoms, aren't we? Man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna work really hard, I'm gonna get a great job, I'm gonna have an awesome career so I can retire someday, and, and, and don't ask me to volunteer in church after I retire because, because I've passed that torch on and I'm not doing that anymore. I'm in retirement mode now and I'm gonna sit on my boat, I'm gonna relax and I'm gonna fish and the rest of the world can just not worry about me, I've done my time. We gotta tear down our kingdoms before we can start building his. How about this? The way of Jesus calls us not to worry. Woo! Right? How many of you are warriors? Let's just come on, just raise your hand. Nudge, you, I'm gonna give you permission. You can elbow the person next to you if you know they're a warrior, okay? <clears throat> Jesus says, do not worry about the clothes you wear, the things you need for your Father in heaven. If even if he feeds the birds of the air, how much more does he care for you? He calls us to live and look for that which is eternal. I skipped that one. Not for what we can see right in front of us. Not for what the world has to offer us. The way of Jesus calls us to take sin seriously. Our own above all else in a world that is doing all it can. The world is doing all it can to justify sin and to, to, to just brush over it and to try to say that things aren't sin that really are sin. This is the way of Jesus. I don't know about you, but when I look at all that stuff that God's calling me to, I'm sitting here going, man, like you ever, you ever get done like playing basketball or something? You're just like, oh man, I can't breathe, right? Like, it's a lot. This is what he's calling us to. And I think we make it a mistake when we say that following Jesus is easy because following Jesus isn't easy. Not once did Jesus ever say that this road would be easy. Now, <clears throat> Is it better? Absolutely. It is, is it easy? Absolutely not. All throughout scripture, we see Jesus calling his people to be holy as he is holy. Holiness, uh, holiness isn't an, an easy thing to achieve. A lot of times, holiness is equated to the process of purification, okay? 
purification. <clears throat> Something that we say in the church a lot is a fancy word called sanctification, the process by which we are made holy, okay? Let's just say that word together. Can we say it? Sanctification, ready? One, two, three. Sanctification, all right? It's this big fancy church word is just this idea of being purified, being made holy, being more, made more like the son as he's called us to be, right? Um, the fancy word we use, sanctification, is rarely, if ever, an easy process. As a matter of fact, many times it's compared to the idea of smelting. Have you ever heard of smelting before? Sticking gold into a furnace and melting it all the way down to its purest form so that the impurities can come to the top. It's a difficult process. I love what uh, Preston Sprinkle wrote on holiness, though, and, and I think this should hit us all as well. Um, he says this, he says, pain often accompanies holiness. Man, I can't wait to follow Jesus, right? <laughs> like, pain often accompanies holiness. And holiness unearths uncanny joy. Holiness, though, is a difficult path for every Christian. And each path toward holiness comes with its own struggles. See, that's the thing. Following Jesus isn't easy. And as a matter of fact, I'll be honest with you, there are a lot of days that I struggle. God, I don't want to love them. Lord, I know I'm supposed to do that, but I'd rather just sit here on the couch. God, I, it's so much easier to just have a drink right now. Lord, I, I know I shouldn't look at that, but man, it's kind of nice to look at. This is the way of Jesus. Now, as always, I, I want to be careful here because, because I'm not talking about earning our salvation, okay? You can't earn your salvation through works. The last thing I want us to leave with this morning is that you'll never be able to follow Jesus or have a relationship with him because you aren't holier than thou, okay? That's not what Rob, Pastor Rob's getting at this morning, okay? I'm just saying, all I'm saying is once you decide to follow Jesus, buckle up, y'all. The roller coaster has just begun, all right? Holiness is a long road, and it's a narrow road, and sometimes, or maybe even many times, it's a difficult road, but I love what my favorite sports center anchor said this week after game four of the NBA Finals, okay? This is, I know he said it just for me, okay? This is the only reason he said it, because God said, Scott Van Pelt, you're going to say these words so that Rob can use them in his message on Sunday. Are you ready? That's how special I am. If you don't know, I'll, we'll meet later. You'll understand, all right? No, I'm just kidding. But he said these words, and it was like, yeah, that's it. Scott Van Pelt said this. He said, anything worth having is almost always on the other side of something difficult. Anything worth having is almost always on the other side of something difficult. This all brings about the question, what should we be paying attention to? How, how do we know that we are truly following the narrow path, following the way of Jesus? Well, I think Jesus gives us the answer as we read on. So we're finally going to get back to the Sermon on the Mount, okay? Um, uh, let's finish out the rest of Jesus' message here and then talk about it. We're going to pick things up in verse 15, okay? After Jesus says, few will find it, he says this. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are like ferocious wolves. Okay, let me just help you understand what he means here, okay? False prophets, the best ones, the good ones, okay, which I'm like, as in good, like the bad, the really bad ones, okay, are really, really good at sprinkling a little bit of truth amongst a bunch of lies. There's a lot of things in culture right now that, 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 that seem like they're the way of Jesus and they're not. I'm here, I'm here to tell you. The best false prophets look like sheep, when inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you'll recognize them, though. You'll see it. Do people pick grapes among thorn bushes or figs among thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. This is a great question for you on whether or not you're really living in, under the way of God. Is your life in chaos and turmoil? Is it spinning out of control and you don't feel like you have any handle on anything? Are the lies beginning to run into each other? There's a good chance that you may not be following Jesus because you're bearing bad fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit 
is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus by their fruit you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name and your name drive out demons and in your name tell them plainly, I never knew you. And then, then, then I will tell you, excuse me, in your name perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down and the, and the streams rose and the wind blew and beat against it, the house. Okay, how many of you are saying the song in your head just now? Right? Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down and the streams rose up and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell with a crash. How do we know we're on the narrow path? That's the question I want to ask you. How do we, how do we, how do we know that we're on the narrow path? Well, I've got three points of application for you this morning, okay? And uh, if I'm honest with you, when I was writing this message this week, I thought I was writing a Sesame Street episode, okay? Because all three points start with the same letter, okay? So today's message is brought to you by the letter F, okay? All right, but seriously, let's get right at it, okay? He says the path is narrow and few will find it. So watch out. Watch out for false prophets. Watch out for false disciples. And don't be a foolish builder. Watch out for false prophets, false disciples, and don't be a foolish builder. To put it all together, what does your fruit, friendship, and foundation look like? What does your fruit, friendship, and foundation look like? That's what I want to challenge you with today. What does your fruit, friendship, foundation look like with God? That's what I want to know. That's what Jesus wants to know. That's what your heavenly Father's looking at and paying attention to. That's what you need to be asking yourself each and every day. What does my fruit, friendship, and foundation look like with God? What does your fruit look like? Are you bearing good fruit or bad fruit? You will know a tree by its what? Fruit. Listen, false prophets... False teachers bear bad fruit. Followers of Jesus bear good fruit. False prophets and false teachers bear bad fruit, and followers of Jesus bear good fruit. Well, what do you mean by fruit, Rob? Well, Scripture talks about fruit all throughout the Bible, from the beginning to the end. You see, when you read throughout Scripture, you actually find out that Jesus, that God talks about Scripture within the context of bearing children, Okay? Making disciples, displaying good character, the fruits of the Spirit. Like God uses this idea or this analogy of fruit over and over and over and over again. Good fruit and bad fruit are themes we can find throughout all of Scripture. And as you think and pray about your own fruit, allow the Holy Spirit to work on you. I'm telling you, we read this last week, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. If you spend time in prayer asking God, Lord, seek me. Look, look at my heart. Am, define my fruit, Lord. He'll show you. I had a good friend uh, uh, that preached at our, fishing, our men's fishing retreat a couple years ago. And he, he, just, he gave us the bottom line that I'll never forget. He said, in everything in life, you need to ask yourself, in every decision you make, will this bear good fruit? Will this bear good fruit? How about your, uh, your friendship with God? In other words, your, how's your relationship with God? Does your faith look more like a relig- ritualistic duty or, or, or does it look like a thoughtful pursuit? I think those middle three verses we read are some of the most convicting and terrifying verses within all of Scripture. Let's just let's just read those again and let let's just let's sink in on us, okay? Verse twenty one, okay. Verse twenty one. We're going to read to twenty three. Jesus says these words: Not everyone who says to me, "Lord, Lord," will enter the kingdom of God, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Have you ever met somebody 
that says, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus, absolutely. And you see no evidence of it whatsoever in their life. I'm not being condemning right now because, because I was that guy. I remember in high school, um, we're sitting in our student center area um, eating lunch and I'm um, talking to all these people and we're having conversations and all of a sudden we kind of get on the topic of God and I start talking about God and this girl looks at me and she goes, you believe in Jesus? And I was like, yeah. She's like, oh, I, I would have never seen it. You want to talk about Conviction. A good tree bears what? Good fruit. It's noticeable. People will see it. But Jesus says, verse 22, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? But I will tell them, I never knew you. <clears throat> I'll tell you what. I pray with everything I've got all the time. Lord, may your words to me be well done, good and faithful servant. But I'll tell you what, this is the most terrifying piece of scripture I read ever. I've ever read. Let me say it that way. I've ever read because I'm so afraid that God might go, I never, I never knew you. All of this boils down to our foundation. Too many people say we believe in Jesus, but very few of them actually have him as their foundation. His word and his way are just a side piece in their life rather than the focus of their life. You get what I'm saying? Like too many people are, are, are saying they follow Jesus or they, they believe in Jesus, but they're not actually following him. I actually think it's really easy to, to say you believe in Jesus. It's really hard to follow him. You get what I'm saying? That's the difference we're talking about this morning. Sure, it's easy to step into a relationship with Jesus. It's harder to stay in relationship with him to maintain it, to walk that narrow path, to stay on that road. Following Jesus is a whole other story than just believing in him. Francis Chan puts it this way. He writes that there are still far too many people on this earth who genuinely believe they can be saved by Christ's atoning death without following him as their Lord. I had one friend tell me, a lot of people want Jesus as their savior. Very few want him as their master. How do we know someone has their foundation in Christ? It's not rocket science. Jesus says it right here. They do what he says. Like they, they do what he says. It's not, it's not rocket science. Only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Only those who have their foundation built on the rock are those that are following me and actually doing what I say. Is Jesus just a savior to you? Or is he your Lord and master? Where is your foundation? Do you actually know what God's word commands you to do and become? Are you really doing what his word says? And if not, what are you doing to try and learn it? As we've been going on through the Sermon on the Mount series, have you been making life change as the spirit convicts you? Let me ask that question. You see, this is where I was blessed as your pastor this last week. Um, I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, uh, this last week, uh, where I was blessed in, in one of the greatest ways I probably ever have been, um, last week we, we had an awesome morning of worship together, and we had, all, we had like a motorcycle Sunday and had a bunch of bikes here, and we did blessings over them, and it was really cool. Um, and I talked about the concept of journeys and how we're on a journey, and that, that God isn't looking for perfection as much as he's looking for a pursuit. He's looking for people that are humble and broken spirits that are, that are trying to pursue Jesus with all they've got. And after the fun of the bike blessing, I had a friend actually call me up. I was sitting at home, um, and I had just gotten home, and my buddy calls me up, and he goes, hey, Rob, I need to, I need to uh, uh, come to your house. And I'm like, dude, I'm trying to, I'm trying to take a nap, y'all. Like, it's Sunday morning. It's Sunday afternoon, okay? Like, like, I'm trying to get my Wesleyan hour, and like, I don't got time. But I was like, all right, man, like, what's going on? And he's like, oh, I just, I need to confess something. And I was like, Okay. <laughs> like, like, I don't get phone calls like that every week, okay? So I was like, okay. Uh, uh, and so um, he comes over to my house, and we sit on my back deck. And, uh, and I find out that not only has he confessed his sins to his wife, but now he's confessing them to me. And that's what it's about, y'all. 
like that's mountaintop experience for Pastor Rob. Because I, I, don't, I don't sit up here to, to yell at you. I don't sit up here to preach at you. I don't sit up here to be a religious legalist towards you. That's like, that's not my goal. My, my goal is to get you to listen to God's Holy Spirit. I'll take, I'll take that one day over a thousand perfect holy days. D- that's following Jesus, y'all. Like that's, that's, that's a real man on a real journey doing everything he can to give everything over to his heavenly father. We're a real church. We're an authentic church. We're a church that wants to do everything we can to be a no matter church. And the things we care about is helping people just take one step closer, one step closer, one step closer to having a faith and a foundation and a friendship with God. What does your fruit, friendship, and foundation look like? And here's the great thing about this question. This is a question you can ask throughout all of life, right? What does your friendship, fruit, and foundation look like? Not just within our faith can we ask a question like this. We can ask this throughout all of life. You need to ask this question as you're raising your kids. What does the fruit, friendship, and foundation look like in this family? Or maybe you need to be asking this question as you're looking for a spouse. What does their fruit, friendship, and foundation look like with Jesus? The one question I always ask girls when they come up to me, that after they say, oh, I found a man, I, I, I ask them one question. Or if, I, if a guy out walks up to me, oh man, I found a girl. Oh, the only question I care about is, does he love Jesus? Does she love Jesus? That's it. Where's their foundation? Where's it at? And if they answer, well, uh, I think so. That, sorry. Good tree bears what? Good fruit. You'll know it, right? Where's your fruit, friendship, and found so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask Jasmine and Dan to come up. And I want to give you guys an opportunity to respond this morning. Um, and then we're going to, we're going to uh, head down to the river and get, ba- get, get a bunch of baptisms done. That sound good? Woo-hoo! Can't wait. Um, the gate's small, y'all. The gate is small. And the path is narrow. I don't got anything to rhyme with narrow, okay? I, got, I don't got that. And over the last few decades, we've been doing everything we can as a, as a big C church, as a nationwide church, to help make people feel comfortable. But here's the thing. The gospel doesn't call us to be comfortable. And I'm going to be honest with some of you this morning, and maybe the Holy Spirit's pressing on you, this on you as well. Some of y'all are too comfortable. Some of you guys are just too comfortable. And the Holy Spirit wants to press in on you, but you've been treating him like he's white noise or you haven't been listening. I don't don't know what it is, or maybe you've never even attempted to listen to him before. I'm here to tell you, he's trying to speak to you today. I do believe that. And were you worshiping with us a few uh, a little bit ago, man? I, I, it was like I felt the tangible presence of God with us when we were singing. Like our God is omnipresent. That means He's everywhere all the time, and, and He's trying to talk to you today. My question is, are you listening? And here's the deal: He wants you to follow Him. He doesn't need you to. He doesn't need anything, but He wants you to follow Him. He desires to be in relationship with you. The question is, are you willing? to take the road less traveled? Are you willing to do that? So this is, this is what we're going to do. We're going to kind of have a little bit of a radical response this morning because by following Jesus, it takes something radical. In order to follow Jesus, it takes something radical. You're, we're asking you, Jesus is asking you to wade upstream from the rest of the world and our culture. Have you ever tried to wade upstream in a river? It's not easy, Right? But that's what Jesus is calling us to. And so this morning, 
I want us to make a radical, have a radical response, and, and, and I just want to give you an opportunity. If you feel like the Holy Spirit's welling up in your heart, before we begin to sing here, I just want you to stand up in declaration of, I'm going to take the road less traveled. I'm going to follow Jesus with everything I got. I don't care if you've been a follower of Jesus already for 20, 30 years. I don't care if today is the first day doing it. I want you to stand on the count of three. Are you ready? Too late. No, Terry, it's too early. You got to sit back down. I'm just kidding. Can we just, can, can we just do this in declaration together? Let's do this, church. And, and, and here's the deal. If you're here today and you're like, you know what, Rob? I'm not sure about this whole church thing. I'm not sure about this whole Jesus thing. And I don't want to be a liar. Please don't stand up. Like, hear my heart. Like, we're not trying to make you feel awkward. There's no one here to judge you. There's no one. We're glad you're here. We hope you come back. We want you to wrestle with Jesus next week, okay? You can do that. But don't stand unless you mean it this morning. You hear me, church? Let's, let's just stand. So I'll sit down, okay? I'll sit down. And we'll do this together. If, you're, if you would say... I, I'm going to take the road less traveled. No matter the highest mountaintop, the lowest valley, I know my God's with me and I'm going to follow him on the straight and narrow. In a couple weeks here, guys, we're going to be diving into a whole sermon series on sexuality. You want to talk about a landmine, okay? Like, you want to talk about a minefield, okay? Um, we're, going to, we're going to follow Jesus. And there's going to be some things pressuring in on us in order to follow Jesus that, that, that it's going to, we're going to have to wait upstream right? So, so are you sure? Are you sure you want to be a follower of the way? Because the implications go much further than you realize. If so, let's, let's stand in declaration to our heavenly father. Ready? One, not yet, Terry, hold on. <laughs> Terry's like, I'm ready to follow Jesus. Let's go. All right. Ready? One, two, three. Let's do it. Heavenly Father, we love you. We love you, Lord. And we thank you and we praise you this morning for everything you're doing in our church and everything you're doing in our lives, God. We, we want to reach out to you. We want to sing to you. We want to worship to you in declaration that we're going to take the road less traveled. We're going to follow your son, Jesus. We're going to give it everything we got, Lord. Um, God, I, I pray for those that, that maybe didn't feel led to stand. God, I pray that you would just make them feel loved and welcomed. And we're so glad they're here, Lord. And, and God, I'm just looking forward to what you want to do in all of us as we wrestle with our faith with you, God. We're all on a journey and we're all at different points. And uh, we just thank you for um, how far you've taken so many of us um, to this day, God. And may we always, always, always hold fast to that narrow way. It's in the powerful name of your son, Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Can we give God some praise this morning? Woo!